from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It is my great pleasure today to introduce Aaron Becker, uh, the writer of a wonderful series of wordless picture books uh, that began in 2013 with Journey. Uh, not only was it the first book in the series, it was also Aaron's first book uh, and earned a Caldecott honor in 2014. The New York Times critic Her Sarah Harrison Smith, the other Harrison Smith, uh, called it a masterwork in her review. Not a bad debut. Uh, and the book tells the story of a lonely girl with a magical red marker. She draws her way from a, a drab, sad-looking city into a brightly colored world of castles and warriors and a friendly purple bird. With a flick of her marker, she can draw a portal, a boat, a balloon, a flying carpet, and bring all these things into life. Uh, the series continued with Quest, which Kirkus Reviews described as a wordless testament to the power of not just imagination, but art itself, and with Return, which came out just last month. Uh, before working with ink and with watercolor in his journey books, Aaron was actually a film designer. Uh, he did backgrounds, buildings, and other elements for movies including Cars, Monster House, The Polar Express, Beowulf, and A Christmas Carol. Uh, again, there will be time for questions after the talk, and I should add that anyone who asks a question will be filmed for the Library of Congress's archives. Aaron's also going to be signing books today from 1.30 to 2.30. Uh, again, please join me in welcoming Aaron Becker to the stage. Thank you, thank you. How's everybody doing this morning? All right. Well. Um, we're going to be telling some stories today, but also have a chance to kind of look underneath the cover to see how I make these books and what they're all about. How many of you, by a show of hands, have ever read Journey before? OK, so we've got some fans here today. That's fantastic. We're going to run through Journey kind of quickly. We're going to do the Reader's Digest version of the book, uh, because I really want to have some time today to talk more about what goes behind the making of these books, as well as get a chance to share with you Return, which has just come out last month. This series of books is something I started when my daughter was born about six and a half years ago now. So this has been my life for the last six years. And to wait this long to finally share this final chapter with everybody, um, it's been a lesson in, uh, in patience for sure. Um, but it's been worth the wait. I'm really excited uh, about how this story has ended and the reception it's gotten. I've been out in uh, touring the country this week. I was in Texas earlier this week and uh, Georgia before that. I'll be heading to Minneapolis and Chicago. And everywhere I go, I talk to librarians, teachers, and school, uh, schools and students, of course, about these books. And it amazes me wherever I go, the children just get it. They understand what to do with these books. It's we adults who've crossed over that bridge to the other side of, of, of grown updom that have forgotten how to just be open to uh, telling stories with our imagination. They, the children really know how to do it. And they pick out things inside of these books that I haven't even noticed yet after living with these books for six years. I'll give you an example. When I was in Georgia, there was a girl who was four years old. And she asked, why does the girl, or why does the emperor, there's an emperor, a bad emperor on this ship, why does the emperor want to cage this beautiful purple bird? And what I do when I tell these stories to a group of children is I don't tell them answers. I just ask them questions, which is really the key to a wordless picture book if you're reading to a child as a, as a grown up, or even if you're a kid and you're reading it for yourself. Ask questions. So what I did is I asked her, well, what do you think? And you know what she said? She said, well, I think that the emperor is capturing the purple, purple bird because he must be afraid of it. He must be afraid of this purple bird. And I thought, that is amazing. That never occurred to me. What a great idea that, of course, of course, we want to put in a cage the things we don't understand. And books are a great way to help us become exposed to the things around us that maybe we've never seen before. 
I think that's why uh, this particular story might be so powerful, is that it is a journey. It's a journey into the realm of our imagination to explore the limits of what might be possible. So let's start with journey. Right away on the cover, we see a girl. She's going towards a castle. She's in a red boat. We're not sure what's happening. But so you ask a question, who is she? Why is she there? What's she going to do? Well, we start out back home. There she is on her scooter. She's back home, a little sad now. And right away, without words, we know how she's feeling. We know how she's feeling because we're human beings. And we have a language that's universal. It's called body language. And when you see someone, you know how they're feeling just by the way they're holding their bodies. So she must be feeling sad, lonely, bored, any number of things. I'll even ask a child, how do you know she's feeling sad, lonely, and bored? Well, they'll explain about how she's sitting. And then I'll say, well, why do you think she's sad? Again, with no words. They know. Well, because the other kids won't play with her, or she's lonely. She doesn't have any friends. Well, I haven't told anyone that. But the child will figure it out. She goes into her house. Her mom and dad are too busy to play. So she finds this red marker in her floor. Again, the red marker. Is it a marker? Is it a chalk? Is it an oil pastel, a, chalk, a piece of a crayon? Maybe a colored pencil? This is also what I do, is I ask the group of children. I'll tell you, or I, I tell them, I know the right answer. And I will tell you, well, every child wants to be right. Oh, I know. It's a crayon. It's a crayon. I know. He's, he's going to say crayon. I say, look inside your head. Close your eyes. And I want you to imagine what it is that she's drawing with. And then I say, whatever's inside your head, that is the right answer. She draws her door, and through the door she goes to a magical realm. This is the beginning of the story. This is the very beginning. She's in this magical fantasy realm, this castle, with waterways instead of roads. There's even a story about this castle. You see, a long time ago, this castle was inherited by a king, a young king. And this king wanted to do a very good job being a king. It was very important to him that he do a better job than his own father. He wanted to make sure that everyone in this kingdom understood the importance of kindness. But he wasn't sure, as a king, how do I teach this? So he would go down to the water every day. You see, his castle was located right by the ocean. And he would look out over the water and watch the sunrise every morning. It was a time for him to think. It was a time for him to think, because all day he was very busy in meetings. He looked out over the water, and one day, as the sun was rising, he saw something. He saw something. Something in the water. Something splash! And it came closer and closer. It disappeared. So the next day, he went back down to the water again, and he watched the sunrise. And he was looking this time, not for the sun, but for something in the water. And soon enough, it emerged again. And it swam closer and closer until finally, out from the water popped a mermaid. And it was no ordinary mermaid. You see, this mermaid was also a young queen. She had just inherited the kingdom under the sea. And she, too, wanted to do a good job as a queen. So they talked for a while, and they realized, perhaps we could join our kingdoms together and work to make this world a better place. But there was a problem. You see, the king, while he was a good swimmer, could not hold his breath and live under the ocean. And the mermaid, well, she didn't have feet. She couldn't walk on land. She couldn't go to the castle. So the king brought his people down the next day. He had an idea. He said, bring your shovels down to the water's edge, and I want you to start digging a hole. Dig a hole from here to there. And they dug, and they dug, and they dug, and they dug all day long until they reached the castle. When they reached the castle wall, boom, they hit the castle wall. 
They looked to the king for instructions. He said, okay, take down the castle wall. They said, what? We can't take down the castle wall. If we take down the castle wall, well, the, we won't be safe. We need that wall. He said, no, 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 for, for now, don't worry about it. Just take it down. They took down the castle wall, then they hit Main Street. And they looked for him for guidance. He said, now what I want you to do is keep digging. Dig up all of Main Street. They thought their king had lost his mind. But they trusted him for now. And they dug and they dug and they dug until they hit the other end of the castle wall. Thunk, and they looked for the king for instructions. He said, now I want you to dig up all the alleyways. And when you reach the end of the alleyways, dig up all the staircases that lead up to the upper levels of this castle and kingdom. Until we are done, I want every single bit of road in this castle dug up, even the sidewalks. And that's what they did. The final day, they came down to the water's edge with their shovels. And I don't know if you've ever been to the beach before, but when you're playing in the ocean and you've dug your tunnels, what happens when you finally connect it to the waves? Well, of course, the water rushes in, and that's just what happened. The water rushes in, it hit the castle wall, it kept going down Main Street, filled the alleyways, filled the staircases, until the entire staircase, until the entire castle was filled with water, with a canal system. Now, the mermaid could come and join him at the castle. And that is why this castle has waterways instead of roads. This one little story, well, it's in my mind. But a child can look at this book in a wordless picture book and make up all sorts of stories like this. It's up to you to decide what's happening behind the scenes. The girl goes through the castle. She draws her way through. She eventually, she eventually finds herself in the sky in a red hot air balloon, and that's where she discovers the, ca the caged purple bird, who she rescues, flies back home through a purple door at the bottom of a palm tree, where a boy awaits. Now, at the very beginning of the story, when she was lonely and we saw the other children playing, Right there on the street, well, the boy actually was standing there, if you look in the book. And up in the sky, the purple bird was flying away. Sometimes the things we're looking for are right in front of us. They draw two circles. He happens to have his own purple magic drawing implement. And they draw a bike. So that was the end of Journey. That was the first book. But by the time Journey was even published, I had finished the drawings for Quest. And it picks up right where we leave off. This time, they go on a much bigger adventure. You see, in Journey, it was sort of the realm of a young child in the imagination. Everything was happening, but yet there was no real danger. She was always going to be OK. In Quest, things get pushed up just a notch to the realm of getting to be an older kid, where suddenly you might have some responsibility in this world. You see, now the castle is on fire, and a king has given them a map. This map holds clues to their adventure ahead. They realize there's more than just a red and a purple drawing implement in this realm with magic. There are other colors as well. And they go on a quest to find them under the ocean. Why, this might be the mermaid's underwater kingdom. Who knows? Into the jungle, to a mountain. Just as they're about to be caught, They've collected all of the markers. The purple bird flies away, paints a rainbow across the sky, saves the kingdom and the king who's been captured. And they come back home after a great celebration, which ends quest. I also tell children here, the imagination, it may not seem like it's a real thing. It might seem like it's something we just do for play. But actually, the imagination is real, because when we go out and we pretend that we're a fast runner, or we pretend that we can be an artist, or we pretend that we can glide across the sky on the back of a Pegasus. A small little part of that play, it ends up inside of us. It does. It really does. It ends up inside of us, and one day it can become real. That's how we use our imagination to manifest what we might want to become one day. And just as these children might have painted a rainbow in a land of make-believe, by the time they came home, that rainbow had followed them. It was no longer raining. And this leaves us off right in time 
for the final chapter in the Journey Trilogy, Return. Alrighty, so here we are, back into the magical world of Journey. Now we see the girl running through the door. This time she's just not walking through and looking at it with amazement. She knows where she's going this time. She has a purpose. She's ready for adventure. The king drew her and the boy an orange crown at the end of Quest to welcome them into this land. So she has it wearing, she's wearing it on her head. But let's take a step back. The story begins right where Journey did. She's still hoping that Dad will play with her. He's busy, he's an architect, drawing at his table. She draws another red door. She's given up. But Dad notices this time. He sees her kite. He follows her down to her bedroom, looks through her magic door, and follows her into the magical realm. In Journey, the girl draws a red boat by this dock. Now she's left a ball there for the father to find, or maybe she just left, left it there by accident. Who knows? He sees it, and as he gets onto the dock, a dragon boat appears around the bend in the river, a glowing green-eyed dragon boat. Perhaps it's evil, but the father has no choice. He has to find his daughter. He jumps aboard and makes his way to the castle. He sees her off in the distance, crossing the bridge on her red boat. By the time he catches up to her, well, she doesn't want to see him. For num number one, he wouldn't play with her. Number two, this is my turf. This is my imagination. You don't belong here, Dad. There's no time to argue. For those familiar with ancient history, you might know something about a Trojan horse. Well, this dragon boat is no ordinary dragon boat. It is a Trojan dragon boat. And inside of its hull was hiding the emperor and his henchmen. They run towards our heroes. The king grabs his orange marker and draws a sword. But the, the emperor is smart. You see, he's been duped by these kids too many times. He's been tricked by them with their magic drawing implements. So he's come with a plan. He's created something out of technology, something like a magic eraser. He cranks the box. It sucks up all of the colored objects, the sword, the crayons. The boy and the girl still have theirs. The boy is, who's always drawing animals, purple ones for that matter, he draws a beast that is half lion and half eagle, a griffin. Well, <clears throat> the emperor was thinking ahead. He wasn't going to be fooled this time. When he built his dragon boat, he made sure that it had wings. And he follows them, and he starts to crank his machine, <laughs> sucking up the purple marker, the griffin. Now our heroes fall through the sky. The boy manages to catch a hold of the king's hand, but the girl and her father fall, fall, fall into the ocean. The girl has her magic imp implement, drawing implement, and she starts to draw a giant shampoo bottle. No, if you remember from the trailer, the animation, you'll remember it's a submarine. And when you get a chance to look at the book, you'll look closely, you'll see the purple bird even has her own little 
earphones on and she's listening to the sonar doop, 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 until they find a sea cave. On the walls of the sea cave are drawings, petroglyphs in fact, that tell an ancient story, a myth, about a land with a red balloon and a purple rhinoceros and a rainbow and a dragon boat and a red submarine. Why, in fact, this story on the walls tells the past, it tells the present, but it also tells a prophecy of what's yet to come. And the girl looks up and she sees a character painted much like her father with a pocket. The dad always has a pocket in his shirts in which he is always putting his work markers in. And the dad's like, me? Now as the shadow of the dragon boat approaches, the dad thinks, perhaps I can learn something from my daughter. Perhaps the word return isn't the return of the girl to her land, but the return of the father to his own imagination. The girl can't believe her eyes. What is happening? Dad has an imagination? He's drawing something for the bird. She's not sure what. Well, it turns out Dad's pretty clever after all. As the emperor runs up, he sucks up the purple bird, but just as he steps onto the platform, the doors close. It's a trap. He's in a cage. He drops his box. The dad picks it up, lifts it up over his head, and when he throws it onto the ground, all of the color is released. The animals are free. The purple bird is free. Even the griffin is free. It picks up the caged emperor, flies away. Now, all along in this cave, for those of us who are very observant, perhaps you've noticed a small door. Perhaps you've noticed, even on the first page of the book, a small door somewhere else in the story. And out from this small door is peeking a red kite. And that is the end of the trilogy. Thank you guys very much. We have five minutes left. I know it's not a lot of time. I have a few slides in another presentation well, I can show you just while I'm talking about some of the things I do to make the book. But are there any immediate questions out there? Yes, ma'am. Are there any plans to make animated films from this book? Are there any plans to make animated films from this book? So the trailers that you see are things that I did myself. Because I worked in animation, I know a few things about how to build things in 3D and make camera moves and create some motion. But I would like to see Journey on a big screen. I do have a background in cinema, and I think that would be fantastic. Um, I can't say anything about it at this time, but let's just say the wheels are turning in, uh, on the West Coast. <laughs> so we'll have to wait. Yes? Um, for your third book, did you um, write it about a girl bonding with her dad because you're, because you wanted to bond with your daughter. Oh my goodness, you're killing me. Did you just draw a dagger with your magic drawing implement? Uh, I think so, for sure. It made a big difference for writing the story. Although I had planned out the entire story when I started Journey and I always wanted her to be met by her family. Originally the mom, and the dad and her sister were going to come and follow her into the realm. But wordless picture books, you have to be very careful and only tell a few things at a time. So I picked one of them, and I did pick the dad, and I think maybe you're right. While I was working on uh, Return, I lived in Spain with my family, and I was, in a, in a couple of weeks, if you go onto my website, we're going to have a video up there about my experiences in Spain. If you go to storybreathing.com, it'll be posted there. And it tells a little bit more about my experiences with my daughter uh, working on this book in a foreign land where I was trying to learn Spanish and also trying to paint at the same time and be a dad. Yes, sir? Why don't you put words in your books? So what happened, some of these uh, slides that you've seen, actually, maybe I can even go backwards. These were the first drawings that I did. 
They're about this big. They're just two inch little pencil sketches on paper. I'm sure you have pencil and paper at home. You can do the same thing. And I had sketched out the whole story. And by the time I came to the end of the story, well, I went back to put words because books have words in them, right? Yeah. And I realized, wait a minute, the story's been told. The only thing I can do is repeat myself at this point. And that is actually how Journey became a wordless picture book. It was not an intentional plan on my part. It just happened that way organically or maybe magically. Yes, miss. How did your idea, how did you uh, make up the idea to write the story? The idea came from a drawing that I did that you've seen up here just a second ago. I'll go back to it from this castle. I drew this castle one day, and it had a little boat in it with a kid going up to the boat, I mean, going up to the castle. And I didn't know, I didn't have a story. Um, we're going to have to wrap up now, but just one last thought here. This is the close-up of that drawing. And children at home, if you're feeling like you're a little scared of drawing, maybe you don't feel like you can draw as well as you can, just remember, every drawing begins with one line. And if you look very closely at my drawings, you'll see they're nothing but one line added to one line added to one line. And I'm going to scoot ahead and just show the young children here that long ago, when I was a child, I made my own books. Almost there. Oh, maybe not. Come on. Wow, I'm showing you lots of fun stuff here. Oh, there she is. There she is. That, there we are in Spain. But I do want to, OK, I, I learned to draw from this gentleman, Ed Emberley, and this was me. So remember, you can do it too. Make your own books. Thank you guys so much. I had a great time. We have one comment, please. We would like to invite you to come to our school. We would like to invite you to come to our Potomac school. <laughs> oh, you know what? I was at the Potomac school, well, but I didn't, get to see, I didn't get to meet the, are you in kindergarten? Yes. I only got to meet the second and the third and the fourth graders. But they have copies of my book in the library. And you, you're a really lucky kid because you have an amazing school and you have quite a journey ahead of you there. Were you there recently? I was there yesterday. <laughs> yeah, because her teacher was talking about you yesterday. Oh, okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.